objective here at Reborn Nation is we've had church this past uh, Wednesday night. We have midweek service at 7 p.m. And uh, we were speaking that in the service. I just felt an unctioning of the Holy Spirit to challenge our midweek service attenders. I said, I believe there's no reason why we can't, but I'm believing that through the next, through the next four months, September, October, November, December, a hundred souls are coming to Jesus Christ's salvation in Reborn Nation. Now that excites me. That's a big number. But I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like it's a daunting challenge. I believe like, I believe that the harvest is ready and all we got to do is put a little effort with God's, God's given a, a harvest and we'll win souls. I believe a hundred souls are going to be added to the kingdom of heaven before 2019 is over right here at Reborn Nation. Amen. And here's the thing, you don't always see the fruit. We had, we had one person, we thought one person accepted Christ last Sunday. And we found out this week that, uh, uh, that, that a couple came. It was their first Sunday, and they, they felt a little nervous about coming down. Because here's how it is. You don't have to come down. The Bible don't say, come to the altar before the congregation, then confess and be saved. It says, confess your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him up from the dead, then you shall be saved. So we had a couple that came last Sunday, first time here, and they gave their hearts to Christ where they were sitting. So three souls were saved last Sunday. Thank God for that. more excited about that. That's three people, that's three souls that were on their way to hell that ain't on, that's on the way to heaven now. That's three souls we took from Satan. My God, that does me good. Hallelujah. And so this morning, I'm preaching a sermon that you can, uh, where are ushers at? We have, we have a couple of handouts. If you would like one, Brother Jared has one. Uh, he's just going to walk through. Just raise up your hand if you want a handout to write notes on. He's got them there. Brother Jared, just find some else to help you walk around and y'all can know it. Y'all not going to distract me. I'm good. So uh, somebody else want to help him? Uh, I t go, go help him, Brother Warren, if you don't mind. Y'all help him hand him out. This morning, preaching on wounded but walking. Wounded but walking. Our, our passage of Scripture this morning is going to be in Genesis chapter 32. And we're going to preach it from a different angle than maybe what you, it sounds like. But here's the reality. A lot of us, matter of fact, we would, we'd be hard-pressed to find a single person in this church today who does not bear the scars of life. Amen. Some scars bigger than others. Some surgeries are more, more intense and, and, and bigger and more drastic than others, correct? Some of us have gone through bad relationships. By bad relationships, I mean this. Here's how a scar can be different. Somebody lied to you, they cheated on you, and they broke your heart. That's a bad scar. Another scar of a bad relationship is somebody physically and emotionally and mentally abused you for five years. That's a different scar. Both scars, but different scars. All of us bear scars in this room today from one, some situation or another. Every one of us has bore the wounds of living life. You cannot walk through life and be unscathed. And you need to further understand that even when you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, he never said that he would give you peace from the storm. He said he'd give you peace in the storm. He said he would rescue you in the prison place. Paul and Silas were bearing the straps of the whip on their back as they praised God, but at the end of the night, a whole household was saved because of the testimony and God honored what they had given. Understand that you're going to live life from this moment forward, even serving the Lord. You're going to find wounds. You're going to have scars. You're going to have hurts. You're going to have pains. But what you got to focus on is not the fact that you're wounded, but that you're still walking, that you're able to put one foot in front of the other, that you're able to make it, that it man knocked you down, but it didn't keep you down. God lifted you back up. God set your feet upon a solid rock. He lifted you from the mess of this world and the mess of this life. So don't worry about the scars. You're going to get them. But keep on realizing that you're walking and you're able to make it and you're progressing and you're not the same today that you were yesterday. Somebody ought to praise him in the house. Hallelujah. I'll preach by myself. Genesis chapter 32. How many of us are familiar with the story of Jacob? Jacob and Esau. Maybe that would jog, jog your memory. Jacob and Esau, the two sons of Isaac. The Bible says they were born, and there was so much wrestling and contention within the womb. Okay? That when they were born, Esau was born first, but Jacob was grabbing his heel. Esau was born with another baby's hand latched onto his heel, and they all came out at one time. And the reason that we need to understand that's important, the reason why that's noteworthy, is because in that day and time, and in many cultures still around the world today, that the firstborn gets everything. 
The firstborn gets the inheritance. The firstborn is the one in charge. And so they were contention, and there's a spiritual battle. So Esau comes out first. Jacob comes out grabbing his heel. The rest of their life, going into their adulthood, adolescence, and teenage years, Jacob tries to make Esau slip up any way that he can. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, he, that Jacob tricks Esau into selling Jacob his birthright for a bowl of soup. I preached a message on that not too many months ago. It said, all for a bowl of soup. If you were here, you remember that message. I hope. I hope. Not only that, Jacob then goes, Isaac's getting older, their daddy's getting older, and he thinks he's about to die, so he calls Esau in to bless him and give him the blessing of the firstborn. Jacob walks in and it disguises his voice. He wraps fur around his arms because Esau was a hairy man. Jacob was not. Some of y'all, I'm going to tell you that if you hear enough that it looks like goat fur on your arms, there's a problem. <laughs> You've got a condition. You need to see a dermatologist ASAP. But the Bible says Esau was so hairy that Jacob put goat skin around his arms and Isaac was blind and he walked out and called him to him. And he said, well, you, you don't really sound like Esau that much, but let me touch you. Jacob puts out his arms and says, well, yeah, you, you hairy as can be. You must be Esau. And so he blesses Jacob and Jacob cheats Esau out of his birthright and his firstborn blessing. And then he runs out of fear because Esau's go ahead and told him, when I get back, I'm going to kill him. So Jacob runs off. But now the fact is, because Jacob's done what he's done, Jacob does have the blessing of the firstborn. Everything Jacob touches grows and turns to gold, and Jacob has a family and has all this stuff. But the time comes, how do you know that you can't run from your past forever? You can't run from your decisions, your mistakes, and your past forever. The Bible says, rest assured. Anybody finish it for me? You're sinning to find you out. That's right. Understand this, when you, you can run from your past, you can run from the, 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 the decisions you made and the things you said till you, till you just wear you, you cannot run forever. Eventually, you're going to have to face the past. In the great words of Rafiki, the past hurts. But you can either run from it or learn from it. Amen. Y'all, y'all act like, where's my millennials at? Come on now. All my Lion King fans, come on. You can run from it, but the effort is futile. Eventually, you're going to have to face your yesterdays. The good news, however, is when you have God on your side, when you've surrendered your yesterdays and your futures to the Lord, when it comes time to face the failures of the past, when it comes time to face our yesterdays, God will be there. He'll have your back. He'll hold you. He'll prop you up, and he'll enable you to withstand the past. Why? Because your latter days will be greater than the past. Amen. Let's read the scripture this morning, Genesis 32. Reading from the NIV. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Now, the reason Jacob did this, let me give you a little prehistory. Jacob is on the eve of coming to see Esau and meeting him face to face for the first time since all the drama went down. Jacob literally sends over all his possessions. He sends them in waves to Esau and says, this, listen, your servant Jacob is willing to give you all of this. You know, because Jacob's like, if he sees me, he's going to kill me. Now I'm gone. The Bible says that Jacob was scared for his life from Esau. He's scared to death, and so he sends over everything. He even sends his wives and children and says, maybe if he sees all the people who depend on me, maybe he'll have mercy on me for their sake. That's what kind of cowardice we're dealing with. That's what Jacob did. Jacob is so scared, he says, if I show him all the people who depend on me, maybe for their sakes he'll have mercy and he won't kill me. Even if he takes all my stuff, if he'll let me live, Read your Bibles. You'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Here's the truth. Continuing on, though. 24. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till, te till daybreak. Then the man saw that he could not overpower him. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. The man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, 
but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name, but he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. He was limping because of his hip. Therefore, this day the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. God bless the reading of his word. Let it be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jacob, that night, fearing for his life, wrestles against God. That's why I changed. That's why I named the place Peniel. I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is reserved. Two things before we dive into the message that I'm not preaching today, but are important points. Number one, God was showing Jacob, you're stronger than you think you are. You're greater than you think you are. You're worth more than what you're settling for. You're mightier than your mistakes. You're meant for more than your mistakes. The second thing he was showing Jacob is that who shall I fear if I have my life has been preserved from, by coming to God face to face? If I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved, then who can take it from me? Understand today, the enemy cannot take your life from you. There's no need to ever be scared of dying because death is beaten. Christ has won the victory. The devil himself cannot snatch your life from you. God holds your life in the palm of his hands. That ought to encourage somebody. See, some of us get sick and we get bad prognosis and diagnosis and we think that it's all over. No, 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 no. God has the final word, not medicine, not science, not the doctors, not the devil, not the disease. God has the final say. Amen. Amen. So going into this, Jacob finds himself, after meeting God face to face, Jacob literally will walk the rest of his days with a limp. Jacob, for the rest of his life, is wounded, but he's walking. He's carrying the, the scar. He's carrying the telltale signs of being wounded, of having gone through something but he keeps walking and he keeps walking and he keeps being blessed and his family keeps growing and his livestock keeps multiplying and his money keeps growing and his house gets bigger and his life gets better because just because you want it don't mean you can't keep walking. Amen. Point number one is this, crippling circumstances. Crippling circumstances. Jacob finds himself at what he believes to be the judgment day of his past. He knows what he's done. How many of you can look over your life before you met Jesus, before you surrendered to Jesus and say, hey, I've done some things I ain't proud of. I've done some things that, that aren't really good. That I, Come on, y'all. Now, I know 90% of y'all ain't so saved. Y'all ain't been talking in tongues and dancing from the womb. Y'all lived some life before you found Jesus. Come on now. How many of you can be honest and say, hey, my former life, I got some stuff. Thank you. The other half of y'all might get saved before service gets over today, then we'll be halfway to our goal. Pastor, you don't know me. You don't know about no, but you're human. <laughs> I know you. Jacob knows what he's done. Jacob knows the mistakes he's made. Jacob knows his past. Jacob knows that Esau has the right to be ticked off. Jacob knows what he took from Esau. So Jacob literally thinks that, hey, Esau's bigger than me, he's stronger than me, he's better than me, he's madder than me, he's the one that was done wrong, not me, tomorrow my brother's going to kill me. If Cain will kill Abel over fruit, what chance do I stand over a lifelong blessing from Esau? He thinks that's going to be his judgment day, so he's scared, he's literally scared to death, he's shaking in his shoes, he's trembling. He knows that he deserves what he thinks is coming. Sometimes the, the reason that we deal with fear, we, we have these issues and we feel crippled by our circumstances, if you ain't done anything wrong, then you're not scared when you get called to the principal's office. How many people ever got called to the principal's office in your school days? But when you know you did something wrong, and then they call down, Miss Brown, could you send Joshua Vivi to Mr. Jones's office? You know immediately. Oh God, right? How many? How many? The moment they call, you're like, Oh God, here it goes. You know why? Because you know what you did, and you know it's the chickens have come home to roost. Amen. 
So that's where Jacob is. He's like, I know I deserve what's about to come. It's coming. I've ran from it, but now I can't run no further. Here it is. He found me. I got to deal with it. He's scared to death. He isn't very optimistic about his chances. He is crippled with fear. Think about this for a moment. Jacob's hip has yet to be touched. Listen now. He's yet to have a limp, but he's frozen on the other side of the river. He is completely healthy, and he can't walk across the river. He sends his livestock. Sends his children, sends his possessions, sends his servant, and yet Jacob hasn't moved an inch because he's crippled with fear. This is powerful. You got to pull this thing. His body's healthy, but he can't move forward because he's crippled with fear. He sends everybody else ahead of him, and he can't move because even though his body's healthy, he's crippled with fear. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying some of y'all have been standing in the same place for five years, not because God ain't touched you, not because God ain't called you, not because God ain't moved in your life, but you have let fear cripple you to the point that you can't move a step forward because all you can think about is all the stuff you've done, how unworthy you are, and how it's all going to fall apart because fear has crippled you and you ain't been able to take a step. Fear cripples everyone who listens to it and gives it all to Fear grips and will cripple everyone who listens to it. That's the difference. We have a little thing we call fight or flight, right? When somebody gets in a life or death situation, there's two responses that your subconscious is going to make for you. Before you ever have time to even think or make a decision, your body's going to either go into fight mode or flight mode. It's called fight or flight. Now what happens though is when you see something coming and you start dealing with fear, and if you start listening to fear, fear will kill you, fear will cost you, fear will cripple you to where you cannot no longer fight or flight. Fear will get a hold of you so bad that you're, you're to the point where you're unable to respond at all. You're just crippled and waiting on the axe to fall. Fear is a dangerous thing. Fear isn't only for the guilty. Fear grips people of all types of situations, regardless of age. Regardless of gender, regardless of race, income, regardless if you're saved or you're a sinner, it don't matter. Fear gets a hold of all of us from time to time. Fear will get a hold of us as much as it can because fear cripples. Fear leads to disaster. Write this down if you have your notes. Fear fights faith and feeds deceit. Fear fights faith and feeds deceit. Fear is the opposite of faith. Bible tells us, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and of a sound mind. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because why? If we, look at, if, we, if we walk by how we see things and how we feel in certain situations, we give fear the opportunity to come in and help make us doubt the things that God has promised and offered to us in faith. And we won't step forward, we won't receive what God has for us, because again, we're crippled by fear, and we look through eyes of fear instead of through eyes of faith. Not only does fear fight faith, Fear feeds into the deceit of the enemy. You'll start believing the lies that he says to you and speaks over you and lobs against you because fear has made you feel like that, that the truth isn't for you. Again, faith is not for you. You'll succumb to the ploys and the lies of the enemy because fear. Jacob had no idea that he was going to meet God that night. Jacob didn't hang back saying, hey, I got to meet with God. Jacob hung back and said, I still ain't got the courage. I can't get over there right now. I'm going to spend the night here. I st I'm still too scared to go meet him face to face. Y'all go. I'll get there when I get there. The thing I want to tell y'all tonight, a lot of us find ourselves in this situation right now. You've seen everything else. You, you've held back. You've laid back on the promises of God. You've laid back on the purpose of God for your life. You've laid back in the situation you're in because you feel like there's no way you can come out on top. There's no way you can get the W. There's no way you can, you can see it through. But what you don't understand is you think you're just hanging back, letting everything go. No, God has a plan to meet you right where you're at. And just because you hung back don't mean that God ain't got a plan. You're going to have a moment when you're going to see God face to face in the situation you find yourself standing in. Fear is a normal human feeling and emotion, but there's also a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So God is not the giver of the spirit of fear. Then where does the spirit of fear come from? 
Satan, hell, yeah. this means, tell me something. If God doesn't give the spirit of fear, the spirit of fear has an origin point. If it ain't from God, it's from the enemy. Now, why would the enemy send a spirit of fear? To cripple you. Why to cripple you? Because the enemy knows what God has waiting on the other side. So the reality is when fear comes knocking at your door, instead of being crippled and listening to fear, your faith ought to spring up and say, oh my God, I must be on the edge of my breakthrough. I must be on the edge of my greatest season because the enemy is sending the spirit of fear to distract me and to scare me and cripple me because the enemy knows if I cross this river, if I make it through the night, when I get a hold of what God has for me, he won't be able to stop me anymore. Hallelujah. As a spirit, fear is strategic. It knows its victims. So what is your fear? That's what it preys on. That's what it attacks. What is your fear? What are you the scaredest of? Is it lack? Is it poverty? See, if you, that's what it is. That's how, the, that's how fear will strike you. That's it will come against you. Is it fear of sickness and disease? You ever hear somebody, well, my, my, my grandpa died of a heart attack at 65. My daddy died of a heart attack at 62. I don't know if I ever make it to C70. They already, they already, you know what I'm saying? You've heard that. People, well, my, my mama had this and her mama had that. It runs in my family, so I guess I, I hope I don't have it too. You only never heard people, I mean, I think we're still in the South. People talk, right? You hear that type of stuff. Is it disease? Is it failure? You're so scared to fail that you won't take a step in risk and believe that God's got something greater for what you've always lived in and had. You pray for God to open doors, then when he does, you're so scared that you're going to fail that you don't trust God in the moment. Is it abuse? You were hurt in previous relationships. So you live alone and you alienate, from, alienate yourself from people. Not only people, but the people of God. Because you're scared somebody's just going to hurt you like the others did. Sound familiar to anybody? How about loneliness? You can't, you can't get married because all you can do is jump from bed to bed to bed because you're too scared to be alone. Fear drives us to react to fear rather than to truth. We'll react to the lie of the enemy. Remember, it feeds deceit. We'll react to fear instead of the truth. We'll believe a lie and we'll settle for brokenness. You'll believe the lie that you ain't worth it, that you'll always be this way. It's all you ever have. Happened to them, so it'll happen to you. You can't trust people. And what good does that do us? We live and we find ourselves crippled in the, and we live crippled in the moment. We never cross over and we just decay over time. We get sour. We get bitter. We get angry. And then we find ourselves all alone with nobody and nothing. Point number two is this. Wounded warriors. Wounded warriors. I love the Wounded Warriors Project. I believe in what it does for our wounded veterans who have served this country and carry the scars of their service. Can we give them a hand? I'm not trying to... I believe in those people. That's what gave me the idea. Because even the people who are wounded warriors, even those veterans who carry the wounds, if they needed to, they'd fight again. They don't, they want, those that are, the wounded warriors wouldn't go running from danger. They'd stand their ground. My God, we could learn a thing or two from them, couldn't we? Write this down. Fear is effective because it focuses on two things. Your past and your pain. Fear is effective because it focuses on two things. Your past and your pain. Fear focuses on the scars you wear and the burdens you bear. That's what fear focuses on. It looks and it sees what's hurt you before. It sees what's done damage to you before. So that's where it attacks you at. Again, it, it has those, those memories, those moments of hurt in the past. It knows where your heart is. And not only does it, does it focus on the scars, but it focuses on the burden. It, you, you, you're so worried about everybody else around you. You're so worried about making everybody else around you happy. You're so worried about pleasing everybody else around you. You're so worried about being there for everybody else that you just find yourself constantly in a rut and you never get to pay attention to where you are because you're so worried about everything else. Let me tell you something, mom and dad. 
I dedicated both my boys to the Lord in their, in, when they were young, like six months old, three months old. I dedicated my baby boys to Jesus. God, they're yours. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it says our children are an inheritance from the Lord. That's what the Word says. Some of y'all think you're raising little devils, but you're not. I said it last week. I lost y'all last week. Some of y'all got so offended when I said, your babies are closer to demons than angels. And I just kind of, whoop, just... It was a joke, and nobody gave me time to explain the joke. It was like, I'm not listening to another word this man says. I'm so mad. My child's perfect. But the Bible says their inheritance from the Lord. So when I had my boys, me and my wife, we had a ded- baby dedication. We dedicated them. Matter of fact, I've dedicated some of your children here at this church today. Now, here's the reality. Do I trust God or not? Do you trust the Lord or not? So when your child gets sick or they're going through hell or they're in, a, they're in this situation in their life, they've, they've left the Lord, they're, they're living on this sinful path, and you're sitting there and you're freaking out, and all you can do is think that they're going to die and go to hell, and you can't live in fear. Here's the reality. Either you trust God or you don't. Because I've sat there with my youngins being sick as dogs and, and fear trying to grip me and say, nope, you know what? God, I dedicate this boy to you. He's yours. He's your responsibility. He's your child. You love him more than I do. You know his yesterday's from his tomorrow's. You will touch him. He may be sick, but the fever ain't going to hurt him. You got him covered. Pastor, what are you saying? Some of y'all can't move forward in ministry. Some of y'all can't move forward in your relationships and in your life because you're so worried about what your child or what your brother or what your auntie's going to do with their life. You got to trust God. You got to trust God. Not only with yourself, you got to trust God with the people that you've prayed for. Either I believe God hears me or I don't. So when I prayed for my uncle, for God to save his soul and radically transform his life, I believe God's heard my prayer. I don't have to sit there, so I get bad news about him tomorrow. Oh, let me go pray. No, I've already prayed. God's got this. I'm not going to sit there and limit myself and, and be and struggling and stuck in a place because of the burdens I bear. Write this down. Nobody wants to go through trauma. And nobody wants to go through drama. Nobody wants to go through trauma, and nobody wants to go through drama. What does this mean? We avoid things that we think are going to hurt us. Rightfully so, right? I'm not telling you to walk into a, you know, uh, out into the middle of the street. I have faith. Not what I'm telling you to do. But we, we, we fear trauma. We don't want to go through things that could potentially hurt us. And so we, we just don't move. Again, let's recall Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king calls them up says, if you don't bow when this trumpet blows, I'm going to throw you into a fire. Now, I don't know about y'all, but fire is a little bit more than traumatic. It is, it is it's, it's death. It's, 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 it's you know, it's going to kill them. And in that moment, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a decision. They can either operate in fear or faith. Right then and there, they've been told, if you don't bow, you're going to die. Now, fear says, self-preservation, bow, ask God to forgive you later. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I know I'm preaching just to me. I know there's people who need to hear this this morning. You face with a challenge, and fear grips your heart, and it's like, well, if, I, if God don't move, if I act in faith and God don't keep me, if God don't sustain me, if God don't help me, then my faith is for naught. You know what? You don't have faith. You've already lost it right then and there. Either you believe God or you don't. Either you have faith or you have fear. It's that simple. Do you believe what God's Word says or not? Do you believe what your subconscious says? Do you believe what the people around you have to say? Or do you believe what God says? It's that simple. Nobody wants trauma. You hear Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Bow or get thrown in the fire. Go ahead. Our God's going to deliver us. They didn't let the fear of trauma stop them. Other things are fear of drama. We know some people live some lifestyles, they get a little dirty, so we don't, we're, we're, we're scared to open up our hearts and to love on people and to minister to people because we don't want their smells getting off on us. But God called us to be fishers of men. Fish stink. Sometimes you're going to get guts on your hands. Sometimes you're going to get scales on your hands. You can't not participate in winning souls for the kingdom of God because you're too worried about what your saved friends or your mom and daddy's going to say about you hanging out with such low lives. Yet I read in my Bible that Jesus was known as the friend of sinners who sat with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the worst of the worst, loving them. He didn't let their drama keep him from pursuing after their souls. We don't trust people 
evil because we've been hurt by people. We stay away from church because somebody offended us. We're wounded warriors and we're struggling to keep moving forward. Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. I, I cannot tell y'all. Those sitting here today, matter of fact, some of y'all told me this. This is not me belittling what you said. I just want to tell you here's the fact of the matter. I, cannot, I could not count. It is impossible for me to count and tell you the times I've heard people tell me, you don't, Pastor, you just don't know what I've gone through. You just don't know what I've been through. You just don't know how bad it's been. And I love you, but here's the fact of the matter. What that shows is that you're so inwardly, inwardly focused is that you've, all you can see is the hurt in your life. You've not noticed the hurt around you. Because the reality is all of us have been through so much and gone through so much hell and so much pain and so much struggle. Everybody in this room has a story to tell. I've got my own story of how God took this boy who was literally homeless for four and a half, five months and restored me in due season. Now, what does that mean? Pastor, you don't know about my struggle. I know, I know about struggle. I was homeless. I don't know about your struggle. I was hiding my car behind stuff so it wouldn't get repossessed. I was hiding that thing. One time I let the air, I, let the, I took the, the tire off just so they couldn't get it. You ain't been broken until you take the tires off your own car. If you've never had to take the tires off your own car, shut up telling me about your broke problem. Well, if you was that broke here, you'd tell them, that's how to tithe and all. Well, I ain't broke no more. That's why. God's blessed me. I drive a brand new Chevy Silverado out the back. I showed you, God's good. God's good all the time. And it's not because I deserve the Chevy. Not because I'm better than anybody else to drive a vehicle. No, because God's blessed me. I was faithful when I didn't have anything. I didn't blame God for my problems. I didn't run from God because I was going through it. I held on to him, and I ran to him, and I said, even though I'm broke, I'm going to believe by faith, and I won't be broke forever. God is still in control. God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. God will meet my needs. He is my provider. He is my ever-present help in my time of trouble. Somebody ought to know him. faithful even when we are faithless. It's okay to be wounded. Point number three, but you got to keep walking the walk. You got to keep walking the walk. What good would it have done God to visit Jacob that night that he did if Jacob had just stayed there and let fear cripple him, continue to beat him? But the Bible says Jacob from that day forward walked with a limp. Now he's walking again. Even though he's been wounded, he's walking again. Why? Because what he's just experienced, even though I'm wounded, God is with me. God's got me. My, somebody, God changed my name. Before I met him tonight, my name was Jacob, which literally is translated deceiver, supplanter. I'm a liar by name. But when I met God, he changed me and changed my life and gave me the name Israel, which means prince with God. My God, I'm from being a deceiver and a liar to being a prince with God. See, you can't come in contact with the Holy One and be the same person you was before you met him. God. I got to keep going, walking the walk. Nobody else can live your life for you. Nobody else. Listen, Pastor Josh can't make your decisions in your life for you. I can't live your life for you. Matter of fact, some of y'all should trust me a little bit more. Next time you get in a bad situation, you ought to call me and ask my advice for you make a stupid decision sometimes. <laughs> I've had people, I say, well, if you'd have just called me, you know what they tell me? I tried to. Your voice never was full. <laughs> 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 Listen, I was making a joke. We ain't going to stay on that for a minute. Nobody else can live your life for you. This means that God has unique and personalized plans just for you. Nobody else can live your life for you. This means God has a personal and unique plan just for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you a future and an expected end. God has a plan. Look at somebody next to you say, God has a plan for you. Look at, somebody, look at the other person on the other side and say, God has a plan for me. <clears throat> now look at Pastor and say, Pastor, we can't look at two people at the same time. 
The reality today is this. There is a mission field with your name on it. There is a mission field with your name on it. Maybe it's where you work. It's at your job. Maybe it's your family that's lost. Maybe it's your book club friends. Or your football team mamas. Whatever it is, it's yours. You understand that you're not in any situation that you're in just anonymously and just some random selection. You're there for a reason. And God's waiting on people to recognize and wake up where they are and who they are so they'll do what he's called them to do where he's called them to be. When we pray over the offering, we say jobs are better jobs. Some of y'all have been praying that for six months. You say, well, I'm still working the same job. Why ain't I got a, job, a new job or a better job? Well, could it be that you still haven't accomplished what God set you forth to do at the job you're at? God can't promote you to the next place when you still ain't done the work in the first place. I say it again. If you ain't ever cleaned the toilet in the church, don't ever think you're going to get the stage in one. Somebody say amen. There's a mission field and it is yours. God had a specific land. Listen to this. This is a point. See, when you read God's word, sometimes this gets lost in translation. God had a specific land for his people out of Egypt. Look here. Y'all look at me. I'm good look up here. God has a specific land for his people out of Egypt. The Bible says he had the, the, not a promised land, the promised land, and it was the land of Canaan. So understand this, before the children of Israel ever leave Egypt, God already has a land set aside for them. He didn't tell them just to go pick some random place to settle. This is powerful, listen. Before they ever got out of bondage, God already had the land he was going to put them in selected. Amen. What does that mean? God has a specific place for you to be. God has specific promises to be delivered to you. He ain't just telling you, see, y'all think it's random. You think anytime you get a job that you just got a job and got, no, you got that job because God gave you that job. He's in control of all of it. If God didn't want you there, you wouldn't be there. Pastor, why am I struggling? It ain't about you struggling. There's somebody else struggling that God wants you to save, and then when you get them saved, you'll stop struggling. He'll move you somewhere else. Yeah. It's not just a random thing. You are right where God wants you to be. There is something there to be done. There is a work to be completed, and there's a work that only you can do. There's ministry set aside waiting for you. There are battles waiting to be won by guess who? You. There's miracles waiting on you. There's breakthrough waiting on you. There's revival waiting on you. There are souls to be saved waiting on you. And you can't get it accomplished if you let fear cripple you in the place where you've been for the past 10 years and you don't move forward in the faith that God's given you to operate in. That should get more than that. I'm going to say. Why? Why am I talking about this point? There are certain things that hinge on you. Well, God will find somebody else. No. God did. He found you. And then what we do, we get uncomfortable with something. So we say, God will find somebody else. It ain't me. I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, the fact that you can't do it makes me prove all the more that's why God picked you for it. Why? Because if God called you to do something that you could do, it ain't God. That's just something you chose to do. God always calls us to places where we have to choose between fear and faith. He calls us to do the impossible without him. That therefore it takes him being in the situation to make it happen. If you could do it on your own, then it ain't a God thing. But if you feel God's calling you to something that feels impossible, something that you know that you can't do, it's beyond who you are and where you are, then go ahead and make your tent there because that's where God's called you to be. You need to wait on your God moment. Don't let fear stop you. You wait on the Lord. And then you walk after he's wounded you. Fourth point, I got to hurry. I'm feeling too good today. I like staying in these things. Fourth point is this, feet of faith. Look at someone next to you and say, you're still here. This means two very important truths for you to remember. This means that, number one, Jesus is with you and he is not done with you. You're still here. That means that Jesus is with you, that he's been with you, 
and he's not done with you. If Jesus was not with you and he was done with you, he'd call you on to heaven. But you're still here. You survived. You made it. That means God was with you, and that's how you made it. And he didn't take you on because he's not done with you yet. You're still here. You made it through the pain. Look at the scars. Did it hurt? It can't hurt. But guess what? You're still alive and kicking. You're still here. You're still blessed. You're still breathing. You're still walking with that limp. And somebody's going to need that testimony. This means Jesus is with you and that he's not done with you. So what do you do now? You walk in faith. You make decisions based on what the Word of God says instead of what your past and fear says. People say, oh, remember when you got hurt? And you say, yep. But I also remember that I'm still walking. Look at me. Yeah, it hurt me. I bear the wound. I got the scar, but devil, I'm walking. <laughs> yeah, what, what you reminded me of, yeah, it did a number. It hurt me. It set me back hard. But you know what? I, still, I ain't at that place no more. I'm here. God brought me out of that place. I'm ready for challenge number two. I'm ready for my next assignment. I'm ready for my next blessing. I'm ready for my next miracle. I'm ready for my next breakthrough. I'm ready for my next victory. Live a life of victory instead of being worried about defeat. Some of us, and I said this to our, our football team on Friday uh, last week, for our scrimmage game at South. I said, guys, when you sit there and you've already considered yourself defeated and you've never even got on the field. I said, we were talking about the Army, talking about, talking about Caleb, matter of fact, and the, the spies coming back. And I said, before they ever fought a, fought a fight or got in a single battle, before an arrow was ever shot, they said, we're grasshoppers in our own side. I preached the message, don't call me a grasshopper here. Remember that? I said, they never even fought a battle. And they said, we're done. I said, you go on the football field, you can't sit there. Don't matter how big they are, don't matter what their record is. If you walk, just walk out and you don't think you got a chance, the game's over. Right. You got to go out there and fight. You got to give yourself a chance to win. And the fact is, if we're worried about defeat, we can't focus on achieving the victory. You ever get, you ever get around, you ever get a moment of faith and you, you're ready to do things and you, you start sharing with people what God's had on your heart? And you get those one or two or all or whoever, and the first thing they say is start naming off why you can't do what God laid on your heart. Anybody ever been around people like that? Can I give you some advice? Take your wounded self. <laughs> and go find somebody who says, you know what, that does seem like a challenge, but if God said it. If you believe God laid that out, then you better do it. And I'm going to believe. Let's pray. Let's pray right now. Let me join with you and agree with you on this thing. That's what you need to get a hold of. Y'all, that's okay. Some of y'all sitting there, you know why? You know why some of y'all quiet? Because you're the one that says all the negative stuff. Uh-huh. You tell, you, 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 you've made a life off of, tell, off of telling people their limitations because you're too scared to move your own self so you don't want nobody moving without you because they just leave you behind. Look at somebody and say, get right. Get right. Or get left. Yeah. You got to love and not worry about hurt. You got to be encouraged and be an encourager instead of being discouraged and being a discourager. Last point is this, and I'm closing. Running the race. There is certainty in this seemingly uncertain world and uncertain day and uncertain life that we live in. Last point is this, God has personally, write this down, designed your course. You think you're running in circles. You think you've taken a wrong, taken a wrong turn. No, 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 no. God's already pre-designed your course. And the turns that you've made, God already knew you were going to make them. And there's a message where you are. There's a word for you in that season that you're living in. There's another turn to be made. There's another leg of the race to be run. And you've got to believe that God's the one who's designed your life and your course. I'm here to tell you today that you can finish this race. I'm here to tell you, I know you may be wounded, but you can keep walking. You don't have to let fear keep limiting you and holding you back. God's touched you. God is in control. Move. 
Don't wait any longer. You can, you can finish the race. You are going to make it with God's help. You're going to make it. Pastor, I'm talking to people who's been in, who have been in the mess for a minute. I ain't talking about you had a bad weekend. I'm talking about you have been in a place of despair. You have been in a season of discouragement. You have been living your life has been a life of disappointment as of late. You find yourself depressed and stressed. You find yourself no joy, no happiness. You don't feel God's presence. You don't feel God's peace. You, are, you have been living. Your address has been made in the dungeon place. You've been living on the other side of the river, and you ain't been able to move forward. I'm here to tell you today that the time has come. That the time has come for you to get up and pack up your stuff and move. It's time to fill out a change of address form. It's time to say, I'm tired of living in this place. God has better for me. See, you want to pass what I'm saying? I'm telling you by faith, you can begin to speak to your mountain. That's what I'm saying. You've been living there because there's been this huge mountain that's been blocking you off and you've been stuck. Well, it's time for somebody, instead of waiting on God to move it, look at it and say, you know what? I have authority in the name of Jesus. I speak to you, mountain. Be removed and cast into the sea to be removed out of my way. Obstacles have got to go. The challenges, the disease is defeated. The victory is won. I'm tired of living here. I'm moving forward. I may be wounded, but by You may have come in here today ready to quit, ready to curl up in your own little ball and just cry. But you can win. It ain't over. Even if the fat lady done sing, God will write another note. God will write another note. Pastor, you don't understand, they foreclose. Okay, God will give you a new house. You understand, I got fired. God will give you a new job. Matter of fact, when he gives you a new job, it'll be a better job, a better pay. Now, we use this testimony for offering and we give and tithe, but send up, Brother Warren, and stop me if I'm saying something incorrect. You start a tithe and you believe God to bless you, and you go to work on a Monday. You've been working a job for years and years and years, and you go to work on a Monday, and they fire you. Unexpected. Oh, God, what are we going to do? They fired him, but before the week was over, the same week, he got another job, a better job, making more money than the one he got fired from. Then, then the company that fires him realized I made a mistake, and they felt bad. Then wrote him a $1,500 check saying, we sorry. Right? You can be seated. Thank you. Keith Baker, walking down. Look at this good-looking man. Been waiting on a kidney transplant forever. I get up to Atlanta, ready to have my surgery. And the, and the day before, we go up there, and all of a sudden they tell us the blood work ain't right. And I go up to get my kidney. Now I can't have my kidney. They're sending me back home without a kidney. Time to panic. Oh, God. That was my shot. I had my, where am I, where, where I going to get another kidney? Is this the end for me? Where am I going to get another kidney? Oh, there was another kidney. They found out within weeks. They bring him up and they do the surgery, they do the transplant. And the kidney, the one that he gets, within seconds of them attaching to his body, starts working. I've just given you three testimonies. Heart attack. Thank you. Gonna be on oxygen the rest of your life. Right there, such a weeder. There's other options. Maybe you can have a little tank. Maybe you just, maybe you ain't gotta, you know, just take it with you. And if you need it, but you're gonna be on oxygen the rest of your life. Back to work. No oxygen needed. Look at God. Why does all this matter, Pastor? Because I'm sharing with you three different testimonies. One, 
how God provides what you thought was stolen or lost. How God heals and restores what you thought was dead. How He undoes what you thought was done. And how He takes poverty and makes provision. Everybody stand to your feet this morning. What does all this have to do with me, Pastor? Because I'm telling you, I, I feel it in my spirit. I feel it all week. There's people going to be in here today who are in the places I've talked about. You've been still. You ain't been able to move. Fear's crippled you. And the reason fear's been able to cripple you is because you've looked down at the scars that you've had. You've thought about all the things you've been through, and you say, I just can't make it again. I can't go through that again, oh God. And you've let fear cripple you and you stay in a place where God ain't never meant for you to ever spend more than a day. And I'm here to tell you, today's your day of deliverance. Today's the day where you're going to get out of your seat. And you're going to come down this altar and you're going to say, God, today's the day that I lay this thing down at your feet. God, I'm going to leave my fear on these altar steps. God, I'm going to, I'm going to leave my disappointment, my discouragement. God, I'm going to leave everything here and I'm going to, I'm going to get up. And I'm going to get up. I'll still be wounded, but when I get up, I'm going to be walking. Because when I get up in this place, I'll know that I have seen the face of God and yet my life is preserved.